All right, well, here we are. As promised, that today is going to be a day to talk about how we know what we know. I'm going to touch a bit on the subject of epistemology. We're going to talk about pre-modern thinking, modern thinking, and post-modern thinking, what we can learn from all of them. And whether or not anyone can actually be objective. That goes a lot into postmodern thinking. Uh, so, we'll begin by talking about the idea of presuppositions and objectivity. Because that's as good of a place to start as any. And I'm going to maintain that there is no such thing as being able to be truly objective on a subject matter. I don't believe there is such a thing as true objectivity. I think people can pretend to be objective. I think people can think that they're objective. But that is one position where modernity has grossly failed. The modern idea that somehow there's this objective thinker that can somehow conclude things in an objective fashion is wrong. And so I'll begin this whole conversation by saying that yes, you are getting the opinion of someone who is a Christian. You are getting the opinion of somebody that grew up in a household with two parents. You're getting the opinion of someone who has uh, a very particular set of beliefs. And so at least from a rationalistic perspective, there's no way I can be objective. There's no way I can be perfectly objective. That's just not going to happen. So, what that means is... You now at least have some semblance of an idea as to what to expect from me. The pre-modern worldview postmodern worldview and the modern worldview all have something to offer us from a philosophical perspective. And since most of you are, well, I'm guessing most of my viewers tend to be smart. Most of my viewers tend to be more rational than most. And so modernism would be a good place to start. Because I know that at least a high proportion of you would like to think that you're about as close to close to being an objective thinker as possible. So, if there are all these smart people around, how is it that we can have differing opinions when presented with the same information? That whole idea just doesn't hold water. You could say, oh, well, it's because we're rational but presented with a different set of information. And I suppose, technically speaking, that's true. But what happens if that information is actually a worldview? What happens if that information is our own perception? What happens if that information is whatever pattern of neurons are firing inside our heads that will not be the same across from one person to the next. Well, that is the definition of subjectivity. Because I as a subject and you as a subject can be thinking about the same thing and coming to wildly different conclusions. So there is no such thing as an objective thinker. 
And that really tends to poke holes in the idea of modernity. Now, modernity is thinking that occurred uh, kind of beginning around the 18th century AD. Now, I say that kind of began that way because that's when, that's around the time when Rene Descartes was alive. It's around the time uh, when the Enlightenment occurred. But the interesting thing is that these ideas aren't particularly new. It's just a question of what's in favor at any given time. Because modernism is generally characterized by rationalism and empiricism. Now, rationalism was, at least in terms of having been written about, it was pioneered by Plato. Plato liked talking about the world of ideal forms. Plato liked talking about Plato liked talking about all sorts of things. Um, but he was largely of the opinion that if one were to merely think properly, they would be able to come to appropriate conclusions about the world. And, well, at least insofar as philosophy goes, knows how to behave in the world. And then, along came Aristotle, who was a student of Plato, who said, well, yeah, you can know a lot by thinking, you can certainly know a lot by your reason, but without context, without data, that accomplishes nothing. And so Aristotle uh, was the first prominent, uh, or at least prominently uh, uh, figured in, his, in history, or in historiography, empiricist. Uh, so you got uh, rationalism from Plato and empiricism from Aristotle. And those positions were somehow, I guess you could say, recycled. It became popular for people to say, okay, I want to be able to think about this, I want to be able to know what's going on by thinking, uh, and I want the proof. And a lot was gained by this uh, return to rationalism and empiricism. Now, granted, all sorts of technological, technological progress has been made throughout all of history, but there was an especially big leap when the scientific method was formalized. You know, the idea of make a hypothesis and then throw everything that you possibly can at it to try to disprove it. And then if, after you've gone and systematically done that and analyzed the results, you go and you realize that something stands, then maybe you dare say, hey, this is true. And that is a very useful way of gathering information about the natural world. Now, and I could also say uh, mathematics, although that, that's kind of a blur between rationalism and empiricism. Though there's a very good case to be made that math is actually pure science, uh, and the experiments that occur are analysis of the logic within the confines of our own head. So rationalism and empiricism can technically uh, be abstracted to the same thing. And both of those are essentially a trust in uh, my or your uh, ability to abstract something and one might even say the truth from the concrete from, 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 from that which is uh, whether that concrete thing be our own brain cells or whether that concrete thing be the world around us and it's kind of pondering these sorts of things that people like well, Descartes wound up saying, I think, therefore I am. Because that was the most basic thing that he was able to think about that would have um, indicated some sort of existence. So he goes back to essentially a definition um, that 
the only way you can know that you exist is if you think about it. And therefore you're going to say, well, okay, that's that's as basic as it gets. I think, therefore, I am done. Okay, and that's a little horseshit, but that's whatever it is. So that's the, so that's the um, modern idea. Now, when it comes to religions, and I hate to go back to Jordan Peterson because I already talked last week or whenever it was about why he annoys me or why, why it bothers me that... why it bothers me that he has been using his platform to perpetuate a worldview that I think is wrong. Um, in addition to helping people in a very, very profound way. Um, so, Peterson essentially believes in the idea of religion as a, um, an emergent Characteristic, if you will, maybe that's not the right word, but an emergent, something emergent of humanity. That religion kind of evolved, or we evolved to be religious, so that we would uh, conduct ourselves appropriately in the world. In other words, those that didn't um, have the propensity toward religion would have died off, uh, because. there was something uh, that was good and evolutionary adaptive about religion. And that then leads to the idea that, okay, well, maybe there's something common to all religions that is good for survival. And then this idea of good for survival, well, that eventually winds up becoming if not Peterson's definition of truth, at least intimately associated therewith, that somehow it's not something that you can just kind of rip out of people. And say, hey, there is a tendency to be, there is a tendency to be religious, and that you can't rip that out of people. Okay, so, but Peterson has this weird idea of of um, it's kind of almost a blend of postmodern thinking and modern thinking. Modern thinking, of course, that we can abstract truth from all sorts of different things. So you can say, okay, the Christians had this idea, and the Muslims had this idea, and the Hindus had this idea, and the Buddhists had this idea, and the atheists, well, no atheist society has survived for long. Um, but that there are some principles of human behavior, shall we say, that are that are um, true across many domains and therefore we can kind of go and say that's about as close to an absolute truth as you can get. But just to remember that that's in light of Peterson's basic premise. And so that means that essentially and alienates all those who believe that there actually is a God and that religion isn't just some sort of emergent property of humanity. And so that means that he and I are on fundamentally different... Uh, we're, we're, we're talking a fundamental, from a fundamentally different set of presuppositions. Which I suppose is okay in a sense as long as we acknowledge that. I bring that up is that um, that touches on, on, on postmodernism. Postmodernists um, went and saw the flaws in modernism, namely that you can't reconcile the irreconcilable, and go and say, okay, we're, we're, we're all of these people are trying to search for one truth, and there's no such thing as an objective thing. Postmodernists realize all this. Postmodernists also go to the extent of saying, well, there is no such thing as objective truth. It's all context-dependent. Now, that's a little bit of an overgeneralization, but it fits. Truth is context-dependent. That's the postmodern idea. And so 
so in a sense, that lends legitimacy to ideas that would have been discarded by modernists. That once again makes, say, the Roman Catholic worldview or the Lutheran worldview or even some sort of, you know, crazy anti-vaxxing uh, hippie weird worldview it, it, it lends it legitimacy because the idea is well okay it's true for you it works for you uh, therefore there, there, there's some sense of legitimacy and I can't go and judge the truth of your worldview because uh, you're viewing the world through different lens and blah 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 okay so postmodernists get the point of no objectivity right in terms of no objective uh, thinkers. But there is, they, I don't think they provide a compelling case that there is no such thing as actual objective truth. And I think that this idea of there being no objective truth, except, of course, for the objective truth, that there is no objective truth, is kind of a consequence of of uh, not uh, 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 or, uh, of people wanting to be left alone so much that they decide they're going to leave other people alone and make a moral principle that um, saying anything about anybody else's worldview is tantamount to not leaving them alone and. Well, it somehow needs to be morally enforced that we, we, we don't uh, we don't upset the apple cart. I don't know, maybe that's a little bit unsophisticated of a worldview to have, but at least it seems to kind of make sense. Bye. 
inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote down words that were from God. There was something actually transcending us from where we can derive truth or from where truth can be revealed rather. Um, that is interesting because there is no proof either for or against this point. Because the transcendent is just that, it's transcendent. And the way that many people try to um, Many people try to make the transcendent imminent by saying that it's some sort of an emergent property of of um, of the material world that we're not aware of yet. So it's mostly a denial of transcendence by trying to explain it by something that's not transcendent. So I'll just flat out say that I believe that there are things that transcend the world that we can experience with our senses and with our reason. And so, whereas I would say the scientific method is great for establishing the veracity of natural facts in accordance with the laws of physics that we can observe, and rationalism is good for the purpose of attempting to, to derive, well, all sorts of things ultimately. Um, from, well, whatever, whatever input uh, empiricism gives us. Um, that still doesn't tell us what's good and what's evil. Because that can't be democratically dictated. say that listening to one's demos, as Socrates did, to one's demos, of course, uh, meaning demon or spirit or, or, or you know, conscience, um, and having everybody doing that results in, you know, and somehow doing a collective weighting of all of it results in good decisions. Um, process doesn't necessarily result in good things happening because still that you can wind up having some someone listening to their conscience and enough people listening to their conscience going and hurting enough other people who are listening to their conscience and so that leads into an entire other can of worms and ultimately is the reason that democracy although very very good uh, in a certain sense fails. left with that pesky idea that maybe God can reveal himself through means that he chooses. That d defy our understanding on a fundamental level, but ultimately must be either just believed or disbelieved. And in terms of the establishment of absolute truth, matters of things like good and evil and whatnot. I am a pre-modernist, and I believe in the Bible as the inherent and infallible Word of God. arguments can be made either way, and, well, the arguments are generally, um, the results of the arguments are determined upon the, 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 the predicates, so, um, you can't agree on that, then you ain't getting anywhere.
but there's something unsettling and in a sense horrifying about the idea that there's something greater than you or someone greater than you who you can only know on his terms. Like last time we talked about what essentially amounts to the first commandment of the Christian faith uh, about not having any other gods and knowing what your god is, is that is in which you fear uh, love, or that is what you fear love and in whom you trust, or in what you trust. The second commandment of the Christian faith, and we're going to go by the Catholics and Lutherans commandments just because it provides a well, it's, it's, you, you can parse them differently, but I'm just going to stick to one so that we don't wind up causing too much confusion. So the second commandment of the Christian faith is, um, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, or you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And um, the, 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 the meaning according to the small catechism, I don't know if it completely does it, the commandment justice. I mean, in a very simple way it does, but there's a lot more to talk about. Um, but the small catechism says, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise and give thanks. And ultimately, you can say that those are the terms by which, in a very general sense, God wants to deal with the world. to the Christian faith. Um, is there are things that you don't involve him in. He is not involved in in, in uh, us cursing people. We don't because we are not infallible. We should not invoke his name in making in swearing or in making a promise. And using satanic arts can also mean like witchcraft or divining or trying to come up with some way of, through some other spirit, telling what the future is going to be. And I would say that, you know, that, that, that can even mean uh, going into mysticism, you know, going and thinking that somehow there's some greater meaning that we can somehow discern because, oh, we were so moved by the sunset last night or the smell of the coffee in the morning or the shape of a rose or whatever, and that imparts meaning to life. Well, I would say that that's a very mild form of, you know, witchcraft or, you know, satanic arts is really kind of a weird way of putting it, but you can even kind of say that. Not that appreciation of nature is a bad thing, but if, if, if all you're left is is dealing with the naturalistic, uh, well, that kind of doesn't leave room for God. Um, but God wants us to be able to call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So that's our response to God, to his existence, and to his work in our lives. <clears throat> to deal with God on his own terms results in, at bare minimum, um, a breaking of the second and third commandments. But if you don't believe in the commandments, I mean, you're, you're kind of exempt from all that anyway. 
or if you think that somehow they're just good teaching from which we can abstract some deeper truth, I mean, go ahead and think that, but that's, that's just a flat-out misrepresentation of Christianity, then. To go and think that you can kind of dispose of this, you shall have no other gods thing, and go straight to, you know, honoring a father and mother, not killing, committing adultery, stealing, uh, bearing false witness or coveting. for uh, putting up with my semi-coherent ramblings uh, to kind of put a nice summary on things I would say that pre-modern epistemology is based on the idea that we know truth through divine revelation Modern epistemology is based on the idea that that um, uh, we can know things, truth through our reason and our senses, and um, postmodern epistemology adds context to the mix and says that okay truth is so certainly opinion uh, and, and, and objectivity. Objectivity isn't a thing and one's opinion is all you can really know and truth is contextually dependent. And so if you go and you think about thinking in this way that provides at least a little bit more of a basis for understanding where it is that you're coming from, where it is that somebody else is coming from, what are their presuppositions and what conclusions can you expect them to make? And how do you actually determine whether it's right or wrong? Because the fact of the matter is there is no definite proof. There is no God and there is no definite proof that there is a God. Now there's evidence but there's no proof. And if I'm wrong, well, then I'm wrong. Right? I mean, if I'm wrong, I'm pretty silly, right? I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And if that never happens, well, I'm going to be eaten by worms and that's going to be it. And Whatever, but if I'm, but if I'm right, if the object of my faith is actually real, then there finally will be proof one day if that actually happens. And I suppose we can talk about one other thing that kind of bothers me, and it's that modern and postmodern Christians seem to be afraid of actually declaring what it is they believe. And it's generally because of the modern view. Because lots of Christians are modernists. They believe that there's some sort of a general truth, and some of some of the people summarize it by things like deeds, not creeds. Okay. And that's a creed, right? Creed is I believe that it doesn't matter what you believe, only what you do. You know, like God is this cosmic judge in the sky with a set of scales or what have you. There's Riverside Drive. I haven't been down this way in a long time. It's beautiful. So then... Wow. I got distracted by 
of the river, I'm sorry. Um, so Christians are impacted by modernism in that they want to be able to be nice and say, well, let's just agree on what we can agree upon and then just leave all the other stuff aside as, as, as incidental. largely sellouts. They're afraid of being ridiculed. The fact is, I already know people ridicule me. I don't really care. And it hurts. It hurts. Well, you think I'm stupid for believing in the resurrection of the dead, or at least many of you probably do. No belief in belief that God can be born of a virgin is kind of stupid. if you believe that this world is all there is. See, anything transcendent is, well, foolishness for people that believe that the only thing that exists is the imminent. And people have been conditioned to believe in imminence for so long that, I don't know. I dare say that it is uh, currently maladaptive for the human race to be in that particular position. Of course, the belief in the scientific method as a way of finding out things has led to many, many great discoveries, but it certainly hasn't led us to know how to deal with them. I mean, living in a world where everyone has nuclear weapons pointed at everyone else isn't, uh, isn't pleasant. As if you think about it. The fact of the matter is the world hasn't blown up yet, so that's at least, a, that's a plus, right? Nobody likes it because it ultimately res re it's a consequence of belief in an entity greater than ourselves, and ultimately, as discussed last week, self deification is very, very tempting for us humans to do. what I was looking at before we kill the before we kill the video. There's some really nice houses downriver from here, but this is still very nice. 
anyhow, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity to stand here and talk about all these things or drive and talk about all these things. And I look forward to going over a few things um, next week. I think at least part of what's going to talk, I'm going to talk about is going to be the third, the third commandment of the Christian faith. But in order to contextualize that a little bit, I think there's um, a lot to be said about um, well. There's there's a little probably a little more epistemology to deal with. A little more, a lot of things. Anyhow, I'll collect my thoughts over the course of this upcoming week, and I'll collect my thoughts over the course of the next drive, and we'll see where things lead, and hopefully be able to have some sort of a uh, fruitful uh, back and forth. Feel free to leave a comment uh, or uh, whatever it is you're supposed to do in YouTube videos. Make sure to like, subscribe, do all those things so that uh, more people can see this sort of stuff. And thank you very much for your for your time and for your patience and uh, look forward to seeing you next week.